So this thing, the reaction energy diagram. Very easy to put my own perspective in and make it look like I know what I'm talking about. But I have a lot of questions. So a reaction energy diagram typically comes in a graph. And usually this is reaction coordinate or reaction process. So essentially where we are in the reaction, here's the reactants, here's the products, and then here's everything that happens in between changing from reactants to products. And then over here is usually energy, maybe enthalpy. So obvious first question, what kind of energy? This potential energy, this kinetic energy, is this the sum of the two? Uh, I don't believe it to be the sum of the two because what I believe is that if you had the sum of the two, you would kind of have a different line where if the sum of your kinetic energy and your potential energy rises above this point, the reaction will happen, and if it doesn't, it won't. But I don't know for sure because I'm not exactly clear on what these energy measurements are and what's happening in the middle, where that actually drives from. So I want to go through and look at some questions that I have as a teacher who's taught reaction energy diagrams and thermal chemistry for a long time of what I don't understand to be true in these cases. Now, let's first start by clarifying that I am well aware that this is probably an inadequate drawing. This is simplified down and that a lot would probably look more like this where they would have multiple steps or something to that effect. I know that we can have endothermic and exothermic changes. I do believe this to be the potential energy of the chemicals, uh, but one of my key questions is, is this for one particle or one set of particles? Or is it for one mole of particles? Or one set, one mole of sets of particles? So when I look at this energy here, and I look at this energy here, and I look at this change in path, is that for a single set of particles to come together and rearrange, and then they have this energy, and then they come back down to here? Or are these measurements actually made by looking at a large quantity of chemicals, and then on average, they come out to be this much change in energy? And I would say that based on my experiences that I believe that it is per one mole of particles and not one set of particles. So when I look at how do we figure out what these activation energies are, and we look at how do we figure out what these enthalpy changes are, we do so with a large quantity of particles. We would not be able to do that with a single set of particles, to my knowledge. Maybe there's some fundamental way to plug into a quantum mechanical computation and figure out a single particle set, but I'm not aware of that. But what I do know is that in order to figure out the activation energy, I make a plot of the natural log of a rate constant at different temperatures, and I plot those natural logs at different 1 over t's, and I end up with a straight line, and the slope of that line is negative Ea over r. And I know that when I'm doing a rate constant, I'm not doing a single set of particles, that wouldn't make any sense. That set of particles would either react or not. There wouldn't be a time scale for it in the same sense of what we're looking at in kinetics. So when I'm looking at this, clearly I'm looking at, I have a mole or two moles or whatever of chemical, and this changes by this much over time. And so this activation energy then is per mole. And then all the experiments that I've ever done that have looked at a change from here to here have done so with a large quantity of chemicals. But what would it look like if it were just one particle set is one of the big questions that I have because sometimes when I'm up here teaching about this, I'm wondering about, well, on a one particle set, this happens and that's not really reflected in here. Maybe on a per mole set, this is what this looks like. For instance, I understand that we can figure out from here to here and from here to here, but how do we know the shape of this thing? Is that intentional? Or could it be this? I don't know. I don't know where the shape derives from, whether it's just arbitrary and convenient to make it into a smooth curve. If we look at a very simple example of here's particle A, it's bonded to particle B, they collide, and then B switches over to becoming next to C, and A ends up by itself. 
if we look at this, the general kind of idea is, is that as B separates from A to C, that the energy goes up, and then as B approaches C, more so than it's separated from A, the energy comes down. And if this bond is stronger than this bond was, I end up lower. And if this bond is stronger than this one is, I end up higher. Okay, I have some understanding of that, but if I look at that single set of particles, a whole, whole rush of questions comes about. For instance, what about the collision? Like, I'm not, B is not going to just travel through space over to C. It's not going to be like, well, C, A, I'm, I'm out of here. They have to collide in order for this to happen. So when they collide, this C hits this B, they're already close. So I have a collision occur. I wouldn't expect the energy to go up where B is separating from A. I would expect it to be going down because it's getting closer to C. Or is this modeling the collision? This is when the collision is starting to happen and they're still pretty far apart. I don't, I don't, but again, I have a hard time rationalizing how that energy of A and B separating can occur at the same time as a collision with C is occurring without the collision starting the process. And so I don't understand why the shape of this comes out the way that it does. And generally speaking, I have a hard time understanding why this energy goes up in the first place, even though I'm looking at this on a particle by particle set basis, I don't know how to rationalize that particular thing. Let's look at some specific examples that are a little less general. So if I have an H plus, and I have some kind of base, and that H plus is attached to something, and we'll, we'll make it into an acid, so we'll put H bonded A. Those two things come and collide with each other. I'm not really sure how to get this potential energy to go up from that collision. Is the potential energy going up because the nuclei of this and the nuclei of this repel each other, or the electrons on this and the electrons on this repel each other? Because I can envision the H breaking apart before that collision with that starts. And once that collision with that starts, why is that energy going up? Now, if we were to say that I have too many electrons around the H+, plus, and therefore there's this electron-electron repulsion, and therefore it goes up, and then as they start to separate, it goes back down to where it's just bonded to the new stronger bond of the stronger base. All right, I have some understanding of that. But I have a hard time rationalizing this, rationalizing this on a particle set by particle set basis and connecting it to here. So again, is this an actual shape? Is there a mathematical justification for how the energy changes in a reaction energy diagram on the way from the reactants to the products? Or is all we know this spot, this spot, and this spot? And someone just went, well, okay. Let's look at a better example. What if we look at a case where we have a copper two plus reacting with zinc metal? And let's assume this is just one transfer of two electrons. I'm not exactly sure how the sequencing of that goes, but let's assume that two electrons are traveling from the zinc atom to a singular copper two plus ion, and the zinc becomes zinc two plus, and the copper becomes neutral. Well, this can occur totally separate from one another. I can have a zinc piece of metal over here in, a, in its solution, and a piece of copper metal over here, And connect them with the wire and hook up a salt bridge. Uh, there's a solution over here, right? So I can do this reaction without any collisions occurring between the particles themselves. So in this case, if I have an energy change from one to the other, what do I do for this one? What does a redox reaction look like? Because I envision that looking a lot more like that. And if that's the case, how do I tie this back to this? And say, well, this still has a rate, and I can measure that rate at different temperatures, so I can find a slope and find the activation energy, and I can come back and come up with this when I find that activation energy. And this one seems to describe a single set of particles, and this one seems to describe the data I get from the activation energy. So, where is this discrepancy resolved in science, or is it resolved? You know, has someone actually sat down and gone, well, why is this the shape of this? Or have we just, in perpetuity, gone through and assigned reaction energy diagrams in this simplistic model without ever engaging in the fact that it doesn't seem to add up when we look at those two distinctions. What would happen at different temperatures? So if we assume just a regular, switch colors here and kind of add a new one, if we assume this, what would that look like 
at a temperature, at a higher temperature or a lower temperature. So at T2, is this just strictly a potential energy and it exactly mirrors this? The activation energy doesn't change, but my number of particles with the activation energy stays the same? Or, at a different temperature, does this cause different levels of collisions to occur that causes a greater distortion of that potential energy? Or, does it cause a greater amount of uh, electrical energy in terms of the interactions in the atoms themselves, which changes the net change in this by a marginal amount? So when we look at a reaction energy diagram, I often think as a teacher that this is static with respect to temperature, but I know at some technical level that can't be true, that there have to be changes based on the temperature itself, because the temperature is going to implicate even the potential energy, because the particles are going to be moving faster on average. So how would that end up reflected in this whole reaction energy diagram when I take that into account? And so when I come back to the simplistic model, sure, it's really easy for me to stand up here and say, ah, the reactants start with less chemical potential energy or potential energy, and then they end up with, with less at the end, and therefore there's more kinetic energy, and the particles are moving faster, and it's exothermic because the particles then bump into the surroundings. But I have a lot of holes in what I understand to be true about this reaction energy diagram that I don't even know where to learn about or approach or whom to ask or what to read to figure out. I don't know what math equation, I don't know what thought process I need to go through in order to figure out this discrepancy between is it a particle set, is it a mole of particles, and when I flip between the two, I have these two competing philosophies for what is happening in a reaction energy diagram. Is a reaction energy diagram locked into a per mole basis and any attempt to do it on a particle set is invalid and doesn't work? And in that case, is there an alternative that I could do with a particle set that would be something more to this effect? And if that's true, why isn't it scaled up? Why when it's scaled up, is it different? And so this is something that I always kind of have in the back of my mind, and I feel like it limits my ability to teach this in a concise manner because I feel disingenuous when I simplify it down into just, here's an energy here, here's an energy here, here's an energy here. See how easy that is.